Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining the discussion today around how to rethink thought leadership in a post-trust world. My name is Manika Tiliumplum, head of North America Vertical Marketing at LinkedIn. Recently, LinkedIn launched our currency of trust hub, which houses a lot of great assets to help you navigate through the post-trust world. Um, I'm really excited about our discussion today because there's going to we're going to get different perspectives from both the researcher as well as the practitioner's perspective. Now I'll pass it on to Jan Schwartz, who is our moderator for today, and he heads up our global agency and channel, channel team at LinkedIn, as well as our esteemed panelist. Great. Good morning, everybody. I'm uh, Jan Schwartz. I'm part of the leadership team here at LinkedIn Marketing Solutions. I'm very excited to welcome you to today's panel. We have a very interesting topic and we have an amazing group of panelists, so I'm really excited to get into it. Um, LinkedIn is here. Our mission is, our vision is to pro connect you all with opportunity. And I really mean all of you. You are our members. Some of you, many of you are our most active members. And we're really here to connect you with opportunity to help you build relationships. And the key to a successful relationship, I'm sure we all know this, what's the key to successful relationships? Anyone of you in a relationship of some kind? <laughs> Sound like Dr. Phil here. Uh, <laughs> trust. The key to a successful relationship is trust. And business is all about relationships, so business is all about trust. And trust is in many ways an extremely valuable currency that brands and businesses have. Potentially it's the most valuable currency. But it's also very, very precarious because we've all seen it happen. Trust takes years to build up and then it can vanish almost overnight. So that's kind of a scary backdrop against which all of us, marketers, communicators, we have to do our daily job. We have to make media decisions. We have to make content decisions. We have to make brand safety decisions against that backdrop. So we really believe at LinkedIn that trust is like the key defining industry issue at the moment, which is why we built this trust hub and which is why we're doing this panel today. And the premise of the panel really is thought leadership is one of the best ways in which you can effectively build up trust, navigate trust issues, and we're here to talk about how to do that well. So let's get into it. Let's have the panel introduce themselves, but I've given them a specific challenge, which <laughs> I'm excited about, and I hope you are too, and you get to participate and vote. The challenge is that thought leadership is all about having a contrarian idea. It's all about <coughs> saying something that the next person next to you doesn't necessarily already know or agree with. But when you go to these panels like we have today, oftentimes everybody violently disagrees with each other, right? Like everyone just says, yes, that's a great point, and here's my point. So in order to kind of get ahead of that challenge, I want each of the panelists to introduce themselves and then state an idea, a thought, a concept that they think most of the rest of the panel disagree with, disagrees with and the room disagrees with. And then we can do a quick vote to see whether you guys agree or disagree. So to give you an example, my contrarian thought would be uh, B2B marketing targets are actually much more emotional than B2C conversations. Does anyone agree with that? Agree with that? Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Agree with that. Most people don't agree, so that's good. That's a contrarian thought. <laughs> All right, Christina. Hi, I'm Christina Ampeel. I am with PwC, and I lead a team that you might consider to be the in-house content agency for PwC. My team of 36 people, we publish on insights on business problems, uh, and particularly the intersections and multidimensionality of the most complex business problems. So that's who we are. So what I hope is contrarian statement is this, that everybody thinks fake news problem is the other's problem and nobody has done anything or changed anything in their behavior to help alleviate that problem. Agree, disagree. Who has actually done something to, have, to alleviate the fake news problem themselves? Personally, like change something in your daily behavior. 
Wow. Wow. I, I'd say you're doing That's well. That's contrarian. <laughs> I actually read my cousin's Facebook postings. <laughs> 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 That's probably more of a sacrifice. I think, I think you're right. It's a sacrifice of love. Ooh. Interesting. Barbara. Okay. So, um, hi everyone. I'm Barbara Pang, uh, and I lead research at BI Intelligence, which is Business Insider's research and analysis service, where we cover what's new and next in digital disruption. Um, really excited about the topic today. We did a deep dive um, into this idea of digital trust. So we wanted to see which digital platforms people trust the most, and we're gonna get into that a little bit later. So my contrarian idea is that we are at peak digital, that with how much we use our phones and screens, um, we cannot fit any more time with digital interfaces in our life. So all the forecasts, they kind of show that the digital is increasing up and to the right. I'm saying we cannot fit another moment. Uh, of digital into our lives for what we have. Peak digital, it's digital old news. Anyone agree with that? <laughs> <laughs> this is good. 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 This is, you guys are, you are really, you're really nailing the assignment. This is great. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, for the audience, uh, we're doing Q&A at the end, so if you have specific questions or want to rebut the, uh, the, the arguments, uh, there's time for that. Thanks, Barbara. Ben. Hi, I'm, uh, good morning, I'm Ben Boyd. I oversee uh, practices and sectors at Edelman, which is the subject matter expertise of the verticals coupled with the oversight of the what we do, if you will, the intersection of those two things. And as a part of that nexus, I also oversee our IP. Um, which is our trust barometer, which is in the field. I was telling Christine in two weeks' time, we hope, for our 18th study, um, and my contrarian uh, provocation. Uh, the fake news phenomenon that's, uh, that we are living through right now, whatever is your definition of that, um, will uh, mean the end of Facebook as we know it within three years. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> That's good, I like it. Any, anyone think that's true? Yes. Oh, I love it. This is really great. Wonderful. All right, good last one, David. Uh, David May, Corporate Chief Marketing Officer at AIG. Uh, my team and I work on uh, branding, advertising, sponsorship, digital, social, just a whole range of things from a corporate perspective. So trust is completely relevant to what we, uh, we do day in, day out. Wonderful. Uh, I would suggest that anybody here who's involved in, in content marketing is engaged in a colossal waste of your career and corporate resources. <laughs> uh, I would ask you one thing. What's the last time you read a white paper from the first word to the last and actually applied anything that you did in it? Oh. <laughs> I rest my case. Yeah. I gotta say, this whole like warm up thing has completely exceeded my expectations. <laughs> been really good. Thank you, thank you, thank you for playing along. This is great. So Ben, I want to start with you because, as you mentioned, Edelman does a huge amount of research into trust and all related issues. So this panel is about thought leadership in a post-trust world. What do we mean when we say post-trust world? Can you paint the picture for us what some of the forces are that are creating this new environment? It, it's, so post-trust world, I would encourage you to go Google it, post-trust, and just read, right? Because there, that we've, it's, we've, we've coined this jargon that I think means many things. But I, I think the overview of what the data suggests um, is that we're fundamentally in, in, a, in a period at least from an 18-year look at the topic of trust, um, where we've seen uh, trust at, at, at its lowest level as it relates to four fundamental institutions. And this is our view on trust. And, and what do we mean by trust, I think, is pretty important. How much, our, our question has been the same, will be the same for 18 years. How much do you trust the institution of government, business, media, or NGO to do the right thing? to do the right thing, that, that's it, right? Now think about that, the right thing in China over an 18 year arc versus the right thing in the US versus the right thing in the UK for that matter, right? It's not an east-west thing, I think it's just, so you've gotta first understand in those 28 markets, 
the, the cultural mindset, but regardless of the differences, because you would have to agree that 28 markets would be profoundly different in terms of governmental types, in terms of news and information flow, in terms of digital access over the 18 years, we see trust at an all-time low. We see a growing divide in trust between the most informed, most wealthy, college-educated consumers of business news and information compared to everyone else in the population. Right? So we saw a 12-point divide in trust last year, uh, or year before, we saw 15 points last year, and I expect that to increase again this year. Um, so where is that distrust coming from? I think it's a profound, it, it's expectations managed lost, right? Um, it, the, the societal and economic fears and challenges that we are facing individually within this country or collectively in the world, um, I think there's greater transparency around those, which is creating higher anxiety and is creating um, a sense of no progress. I'm not experiencing progress in my pocketbook, and I'm not experiencing progress in the landscape that I'm looking at in terms of the way the world, that, that I see the world unfolding. And I think what's not necessarily conscious is I'm seeing more at, at greater depths in terms of how the world is unfolding than I ever have before. I'm seeing it faster, right? And that's leading to entrenchment. We see um, a, the trust in media at an all-time low, but I'd also encourage you to think about the notion of the term media over an 18-year arc. 18 years ago, there was no Facebook. There was no social, right? So the definition has inherently changed over the time of the study. Last year, we also looked at the notion of kind of that um, media engagement. I, I found it fascinating that out of the 28 markets, 61% trusted an algorithm from a search engine more than the 39% who trusted a human editor. Never mind the fact that humans actually wrote the algorithms that <laughs> delivered the result, right? 47% um, um, said that they rarely change their opinion on social issues of consequence, and two and three said that they don't actually go and look at news and information that, that suggest opinions that they don't agree with. So, you know, how we break through um, it is a challenge, but I think what we saw that was pretty powerful in terms, of, in, in terms of how you would engage that mindset is for the first time in a decade where we've asked this notion of credibility of spokesperson, a person like myself, a peer, moved to the top of that rank order, right? So I'm very much looking at those who are, in, who are going through this world with me, beside me, lit figuratively, right? And that's who I trust. For the first time in, in, eight, in 17 years, we saw a question um, in all 28 markets downtick. Usually you have one market here or there where somebody's an outlier. In all 28 markets, trust in the CEO fell in all 28 markets. I don't actually think that portends well for business writ large because I think that speaks to an expectation, maybe unfair, I would argue, that that corner office is the person who's going to drive change. Um, and then our other study, our earned brand study, looked at the notion of the depth of relationship between consumer and brand um, with the acknowledgement that we move from a stage of measurable hour scale indifferent to committed. And committed is incredibly important because that committed relationship means that that consumer is going to buy, defend, advocate, and remain loyal. Longer, harder, deeper, right? You get in trouble, they're going to come to your defense. You issue a premium product, they're going to pay a premium for it, right? I cost you on the aisle to get you to buy this thing because this is, you know, I'm passionate about this thing. Um, and there is room for deepening uh, that relationship, and what's the real driver of that is the increasing notion of the belief-driven buyer. 53% uh, of respondents said that they were, had, in the past 12 months, boycotted or bought based on an issue association between their life and that brand. And by the same plurality, they said they were buying and boycotting more and more often. So I think that belief-driven buyer is, is perhaps not a blip in terms of some of what we may see as one-offs. Um, but growing expectation um, around brands in terms of how people are defining themselves uh, in today's world through association. So um, I think overall the numbers, you could look at them as incredibly depressing. Um, I think they uh, suggest a tremendous opportunity uh, for those brands, for those enterprises, 
um, who can find, who can, I think, identify and move through the world with authentic values-based behavior um, and who are kind of courageous uh, at a moment when I think consumers are looking for courage. Fascinating. Barbara, let's jump to you in terms of the research that you've done around media <laughs> trust and media channel channels. Do any of these themes uh, resonate with you as well? What are some of the key storylines that you've found in your work? Definitely. Um, so I think as a, as a thought leader, <coughs> You need people to believe what you're saying and to trust your message. So you want to have the right message delivered to the right audience, but you want to do it in the right environment, in a place where they're most receptive to hear what you have to say. So um, I want to make this a little bit more real. Um, I am a huge Billy Joel fan. Billy Joel is coming and touring. Um, he's going to be at Madison Square Garden. So um, let's imagine that I am going to buy a ticket to that concert, and I'm going to do it on the street in front of Penn Station. Um, and I walk up to this gentleman, and I'm looking at him. I'm looking that he is standing next to a garbage can, that there are some suspect people around him um, that may or may not be with him. Um, I look at the tickets. They look like really good seats. Um, he wants a lot of money. I'm, I'm on high alert. I'm trying to figure out do I trust what this guy is saying? Am I going to get robbed? Should I be running? Um, imagine that exact same interaction, but at the box office. So I go to the box office. That gentleman says the same exact thing, same person. Um, I might scrutinize that price, but really, I'm supposed to be buying tickets right there. That interaction goes much smoother. So in that first example, in that first part of the example, um, I'm really thinking that this is a suspect interaction, that I'm trying to look and see environmental cues that tell me whether or not this is okay. So this is really the core of the Digital Trust Report, is that context, environment, matters a lot. So as I mentioned in, in the opening, um, we broke trust down into five different areas. And we want to look at all of the major <coughs> digital platforms. Um, so we asked people about those five different areas, um, and we rolled up the results to find the most trusted digital platform. And overwhelmingly, respondents said that LinkedIn is the most trusted, um, the most trusted digital platform. So I want to break this down into, into two areas. One is one of those tenets of trust I was talking about, which is legitimacy. So this is, to your point, um, is this platform going to show me deceptive content? Do I trust the content that I'm seeing here? Um, and 55% of respondents said that LinkedIn had the most reputable and legitimate content. That is huge. For comparison, um, the, the platform that came in second place was at 17%, um, and that was Facebook who's going to be gone in three years. <laughs> <laughs> or operate differently than it or is operating yeah, now. Exactly. Quite nuanced. <laughs> right? Um, but uh, what that says um, is that uh, content, and I guess for this conversation, you know, branded content or campaigns, are, are more likely to be seen as forthright and honest. Um, and you're kind of starting ahead, because um, people will see that message and think those things. Um, and in addition, content on LinkedIn is alongside other reputable content. So that's a really great environment. The second point to this um, is around mindset. Because um, you know, as people, we are in different mindsets. Um, we behave differently in different, in different platforms, um, in different environments. So once again, a little bit more personal example. Um, I go onto Facebook. I'm expecting to see a picture of my cousin's baby. Um, I'm expecting to press the like button. I'm expecting to put uh, emojis with heart eyes all over her page because she loves that and I would never use it anywhere else. Um, so that's what I'm expecting to see and that's what my interaction looks like. When I go onto LinkedIn, so I was just at Mobile World Congress Americas out in San Francisco. Um, I'm going there to connect with people that I met at that conference. I'm going there to meet um, new contacts, new business contacts. 
I'm going there because something happened and I want to see what other leaders, thought leaders in the space, think about it. So I'm going to this environment and I'm in a mindset to have a business professional interaction. Um, so wrapping those two points together, um, you have one, people are at LinkedIn and they trust what you're saying. You don't have trust, you don't have anything. Um, and second is that they're prepared to have a conversation around business um, and around the things that they're doing in their industry. So really when you wrap that together, it's a really good environment and a really fertile ground for thought leadership. Great. Yeah, I mean, my, my addition to that would be, obviously it's very flattering to see that LinkedIn is doing so well, but to me it's like, it's essentially common sense <coughs> that people have known long before digital that context is important, that it's important to talk to someone when they're ready to talk to you, and that somehow, like in this digital gold rush, we kind of lost track of mm. some of these like very basic principles because there's so much reach and they're so cheap and you can measure so many different things, whether they're the right things or not, et cetera. So it really seems to me that like a lot of it is like going back to like good old fashioned principles of like mean what you say, say what you mean, you know, like really kind of back to the, to the to basics of building trust, building relationships, et cetera. But I really would like to hear from the brand stewards. We have two on our, on our panel here, Christina and David, who run brands, who have to navigate this world. So I'd love to get your take from both what Ben said, what Barbara said, context from a media perspective, context from a kind of trust environment perspective. It's a tough job. Like, How do you navigate all that? Right. So post trust, I would say I'm totally not. I'm not totally there. Post easy trust mm. for sure, right? Because I think we all kind of learned and experimented on social media and all the new gadgets that we have. Oh, I can be a publisher. Oh, I can get put my point of view on there, right? So we also learn about clickbait. Ooh, how can I title my stuff so that I get a lot of likes and shares, right? So a lot of these behaviors we acquired are just kind of reacting to the new technologies and the new platforms. We are between two trust worlds. One that was dependent on old trust mechanisms and one that still has to be built, that has to use new trust mechanisms. So PwC studied a century of trust in business, right, and society. Whenever we got a breakdown in trust, what happened? And what principles kind of make those trust mechanisms cohere. Four of them, shared purpose, contracts, consequences when you don't stick to a contract, and information. Well, even if you stop to the same principles, because of, I think, uh, the alienation of a certain part of society, we no longer have shared purpose. Many of the contracts in digital are implied. They're not written into law. The contract that Facebook you know, has is that I will respect the use of all the data that you share with me, right? It's an implicit contract, not tested in court. Number three, consequences. If we shared fake news on Facebook, would we ever suffer the consequence? Maybe some troll, you know, but never really the kind of consequences that our old trust mechanisms really built up. And information, oh my gosh, we're drinking from a fire hose. We knew how to build trust in a world where information was limited and curated, right, and served up by people with standards. And all of a sudden, we're drinking from a fire hose. Everybody is an analyst, right? Everybody can write. So same principles, changed conditions. The main trust mechanism we relied on in the past was regulation. Regulation can no longer keep up with the pace. And so I think we're in between worlds. We are post-easy trust, and we have yet to craft together the new trust mechanisms for this world that we live in today. And it's crucial to CEOs. 58% of CEOs told us last year in our global CEO survey that 58% um, of them are worried about how lack of trust is going to be an impediment to growth. Because guess what? When you look at all of the plans of businesses now, they're going fully digital. They're going and solving big problems. They can't do it without technology. They can't do it without using and you know, entering territory of emerging risks. And so it's so crucially important. And, and so PwC realizes that. Our purpose is, in fact, build trust in society. 
and help solve complex problems. So we realize the, the world we live in, but it, it's inviting a lot of co-creation. David, you spent the last 20 years working at two very interesting companies, Goldman Sachs and AIG. Mm -hmm. um, through that lens, what's your take on what we've discussed so far? Well, a, a few things. Um, one is, you know, you asked us to be provocative, so I gave it a shot, but it didn't really get a response until I personalized it, right? Until I said, you're wasting your career if you're doing the kind of traditional thought leadership. Oh, you're talking to me, right? And something that's really important to me. And I think that's the lens you have to see trust through, is trust, yes, yeah, sure, I trust institutions to, you know, be institutional, mm -hmm. but really where trust hits the most important part is when it's an individual kind of contract and not me and Facebook, mm -hmm. which, you know, is that an implied contract or a real contract? I think I signed away the rights to all my family photographs <laughs> that I posted there, <laughs> right? So, so I'm not quite sure what the nature of that relationship is, yeah. right? So if, if you think about it in terms of how personal trust is and how personal, I'm gonna make a leap to go to thought leadership because that's also one of the topics, we do it in a number of ways. The first thing we've done is we measure it, and we've clearly identified that far and away, the recommendation of a friend or a trusted advisor mm. is the far and away number one driver of your insurance choice. Because let's face it, high importance, relatively low interest category. How many of you actually woke up this morning and thought about your insurance agent, <laughs> right? Or thought, geez, I can't wait to call her or him. Right? It's really important. Your entire life is surrounded by insurance that makes it safer for you to do the things that you do, whether it's personal or professional. And yet you don't really want to think about it because you want to focus on the things that you're doing. So we look at how do you establish those personal relationships in that kind of an environment. And one of the things we do is Danny Glance over here runs our sponsorship team. And one of our highest metrics of success is getting our clients, our distribution partners, to engage with our people in a trusted, shared environment. Whether it be a classic conference, or a sporting event, or a theatrical event, or whatever it may be, how do you create those personal relationships and interactions that are so crucial to driving trust? Another one of our team members who's here is Julia Pauling, who's done a lot of work with LinkedIn on targeting. We don't have a lot of money, we're corporate, right? We're cost centers. We're not tried, tied to a product. We don't drive revenue. We're a cost center, right? So we need to be sensitive to that. So we need to be very targeted in what we do and how we do it, recognizing the role of the digital ecosystem in, uh, in people's decision-making processes. Mm -hmm. One of the things we did was with one of our partners funded a study into how people actually use their digital expertise to influence others. So not just the traditional, yeah, I know you, I like you, we went to the same schools, we worked with some of the same companies, but also you're really sophisticated at how you use data to influence how I think about the things that are important to you and to me. All right? So we've identified those people, working with LinkedIn and other partners, we've targeted them, and we're talking directly to them because we recognize this world and say, all right, fine, the sophistication with which people can use the digital tools that are available to them and the data that's available to them is gonna be a driver of how we all engage with them. And the knock-on effect of that is gonna be extremely helpful. You know, by the way, you can measure all that, right? Which in a quantitative business, with a cost center, where trust is kinda, of, right? That all matters. The final thing I'd say is, um, is with one of the, the brands I worked with years ago, um, and this has been an issue across a number of different brands that I've worked with, um, but both on the agency side and then as, as a client as well. We did some qualitative research, and I would make a plug for qualitative research because you can hear really interesting things when you listen to how people couch their thoughts and their feelings. And this one guy said, I trust that company or that brand to be really good at what they do. I don't trust them to always do it to my benefit. Mm. All right? And if you think about that, what he was identifying, this was a CEO, what he was identifying was the core of what makes a professional relationship trustworthy, which is you have your self-interests. Right? You're trying to sell me something. I'm trying to sell you something. All right? But if I trust you to be really good at what you do, mm. then as a hopefully 
thoughtful, experienced professional, I can make my judgment on the basis of what you're talking about. And everything that I've done in terms of uh, the different categories I've been in, the quality of the product offer is the foundation of trust. Not what we think about it, not our newest ideas, not our leadership. It's the quality of the product offer and my ability to judge it is the foundation of whether or not I'm going to trust you. Mm -hmm. And so I just leave it at that. Great. Mm -hmm. I want to progress a little bit into the more practical advice part of, the se of, this, of this panel and really talk about like the media mix. You talked about targeting David, Christina, to what extent do you see a trade-off in terms of like good thought leadership of try and get as much content out there and get, get as much reach and get as much distribution versus really focusing on the quality of the interaction, quality of engagement, quality of context. I, there's clearly a trade-off there. How, how, do you, how do you as a business like PwC, how do you, how do you approach that? Right, so I do agree with David that uh, the promise of digital isn't the reach, right? That's the first promise of digital, if you go on all these channels, is that you reach you know, as much as you can. The real promise, though, at the very end, is the engagement and the personal interaction. That's kind of the, the ultimate game. And so we just you know, manage how we distribute to reach as many people as we can that we think will find our thought leadership relevant and useful to them. But we eventually want, right through the use of Eloqua, the right channels, and other measurement tools, to find those people who actually have followed us, right, have signed up for us, have actually, and we do this, we know exactly who have binged on our content. And because we have account managers out in the field to pass the information through to them and say, you know, this person actually has shown a lot of interest in this particular topic. Maybe there's something there. And sure, to our, pers to our interest, right, we sell something. But to the person we reach, we actually were delivering something helpful, right? And if that happens, if they think that we're worthy of, you know, being hired to do something to help them solve a problem, then that's good for them and for us. But that's the promise of digital. Uh, and we're trying to make it happen um, in the firm. Mm -hmm. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. Um, in terms of communicating authentically, we've heard from Ben that there's not a lot of trust in the CEO suite anymore, and that's really about peers who become experts, and we trust personal recommendations much more than we trust institutional recommendations. So what do you as practitioners, again, let's start with David and Christina, what do you do to kind of bring the whole organization along and bring at least the key individuals who make up that organization? And how to balance that trade off against, especially if you're AIG or previously Goldman, you can't just have everyone get on a soapbox and talk about whatever they want to talk about. I mean, the messaging has to be very, very controlled to some extent. So how do you handle those, those tensions? Uh, well, I, I would say a couple of things. Yeah. Um, uh, one is I'm a huge believer in the importance of frequency uh, in messaging. Um, that, that, you know, we all talk about reach and will you reach your audience, I think, to Christine's point. Um, but the fact is nobody out there is eagerly awaiting the next message from your brand. They're really not. There are plenty of other providers who can reach them. There are plenty of other ways that they can cover that need. Um, the importance of breaking through, and therefore the importance of, I would argue, in this world, paid media uh, is crucial. It is not sufficient to simply have an article in the Wall Street Journal, or to simply do an organic post in your social platform of, of uh, favor, right? You've gotta buy those eyeballs. Now that puts a requirement on you as well. If I'm gonna be pestering you regularly, at least six or eight or 10 times in order for my message to break through, I sure as hell better be valuable to you in some way, <laughs> right? Either because what I'm saying is so damn smart that you're just gobsmacked, right? Or it's so clever and charming that you just have to smile, right? And you can see that in, in the businesses I've been engaged in in both ways. Geico spends a billion to a year in advertising and they charm the hell out of you. 
right? It's fun work, it's innovative, it's creative, it's engaging. You don't mind seeing the Geico ad, right? So, so there are models out there for what to do. I would argue for, for a B2B marketer, um, which I've spent most of my career doing, um, one shape or another, that uh, there's a crucial different, uh, difference between thought leadership where we all kind of think that leadership is a function of how smart we are, how thoughtful we are, right? How innovative we are, that we're gonna tell you something that you don't know anything about and, and wow, you're gonna really have scales from your eyes. I think there's a difference between that and thoughtful leadership. And I think that's where the hunger is. There's plenty of thought leadership in the world. There's a dearth of thoughtful leadership and if you can demonstrate thoughtful leadership, then I think people will give you time. The challenge is, What's the nature of thoughtful leadership from your organization? I also think thoughtful leadership is, is more than white paper, right? It, I mean, I think we, we have to be careful. I, I had a meeting last week um, with a client, big brand. They wanted to see case studies from other clients who were doing X, Y, or Z. And I took that assignment, which is typically what I do, and try to perform like a SEAL, right? Say, yes, I can deliver that. Um, and I thought, that, that's, kind of, that's really become a flawed expectation, mm -hmm. right? It, it's not about the singularity of a tactic in today's world. It's the aggregate of the behavior. It's the aggregate of you know, that thoughtful leadership is how is that embodied in the way that the brand and the enterprise moves through the world in terms of where and what the CEO is saying in terms of how the thought leadership behind that thoughtful leadership platform is articulating that point of view, that value add to the consumer because it's so mm -hmm. clever or gobsmackingly brilliant. Um, how, is the, how are the employees being engaged, right? How are they in a peer-to-peer -peer world moving across their channels and their ecosystems to advance and carry that message forward? How, how am I experiencing that brand? So what I ended up doing was telling the story of a couple of different brands in the totality of a number of different exercises. So I think that your question around bringing the organization along is as marketers and communicators today, it's no longer, the one, the one brilliant campaign will not sustain anything. Hmm. It might create a blip of awareness, it might create a blip of affinity, it might create a blip of sale. But, it, but today's, I think today's consumer expect more over the long term in terms of sustainable yeah. behavior that leads to relationship you know, driven mm -hmm. through engagement. Yeah, and that's certainly something in our uh, currency of trust research work on our hub, we talk a lot about you have to be present, you have to be constant, you have yeah. to be there at the right moments. It can't be in and out too much. Uh, Cr I wanted to say something specific because PwC is more than 200,000 people around the world. And uh, I start from the observation that breakdowns in trust happen in intersections that are unattended. Think about the financial crisis and the cascading of systemic risk. And too fast with no accountabilities along the way, right? Or now for fake news, who's responsible for for that, right? So we, and, and I think right now, some of the new trust mechanism is to maintain a thought leadership group that takes input from different expert areas and really multi-dimensional. And for us then, it's so crucial that we actually work together with other people. We're tackling general data protection regulation now, an EU thing, but affects the US. So we have a global group that's doing all of the content planning and making sure we get the privacy expert, et cetera, and the people who are in the compliance world. But we know we've got to reach out to people outside, the ethicists, right? The ones who are philosophically thinking about what privacy is and how you can assert your right over your personal privacy. So uh, we move in packs. We bring experts in, inside and outside. We are conveners of multiple dimensions and expertise. And if we do that right, then we are delivering what we PwC can probably, among just a few companies, can uniquely deliver. It's an interesting challenge, you know. As a Catholic, people say, well, sometimes a metaphor is I have to genuflect in front of many other people to get them in and buy off on a particular point of view. Uh, but it is the way we should operate now. Uh, thought leadership is thought fellowship. Being in a community of experts, deep experts, 
who need to get out of their silos to contribute to answering complex problems of today. No, I love that the thought fellowship and then what David said earlier in terms of thoughtful leadership. I think yep. those are both really great concepts. Barbara, do you have anything you want to add? Um, so I think uh, we've been talking quite a bit about um, kind of breaches of trust, mm -hmm. right? These edge cases where um, something has happened and I have to respond to it. Um, and I don't think that you know we should really just wait for those things to happen, whether or not whether it's the you know what happened with YouTube earlier this year, where we're like, oh, I should be thinking about trust. Trust should be part of what we're thinking about in not the edge cases, in, in the mass in the middle. Um, so, you know, we, we talk about reach, we talk about, um, you know, audience, um, and, you know, we talk about message. Um, thinking about adding trust into, into that plan, into that, into that thought, mm -hmm. um, I think is, is pretty huge. Yeah, so it's planning ahead, which actually reminds me of something I've heard Ben say, which is it's a, it's not a question of, of if, it's a question of when a company is gonna have some sort mm. of a problem around trust. No matter how well behaved you are, you're gonna run into something sooner or later. So being prepared is the one thing that you can control. The other stuff you may not be able to control. Um, great, so we're almost ready for audience questions, but I wanna do one speed round starting with David, just really going through with everyone and say, okay, we believe that thought leadership is a very, effect, a very effective tool to build trust, to communicate your brand, et cetera. What is the sort of nuts and bolts practical advice that you would give someone who is maybe starting out, maybe not that experienced yet in the field? Like, what have you learned? What would you recommend they, they do? It can be anything. Yeah, I'll, I'll just touch yeah. on what a couple of my colleagues yeah. up here uh, just mentioned, which is the role of your, uh, the role of your people, whether it's 200,000 people or 20 people. Um, to, to make sure that y your internal employee colleague base understands what the company actually stands for. Um, I don't believe in live the brand. I think that's a bunch of hooey. You know, you should be living your life, not a brand. Um, but I do believe that you should understand your brand and that it's part of your responsibility to represent your brand well. And that is a job for communicators, yep. uh, as we all are on this panel. Great, Ben. I would I would ensure <laughs> that whatever is the thought leadership platform, the focus, the content is aligned clearly in a value additive way mm -hmm. to to the end user, but also is is connected to the authentic value and mission, you know, of the enterprise. This is not about you know these aren't endeavors about around saving baby seals, right? I mean there are many issues and many dimensions on issues that create opportunity. So ensure that there's connectivity and that you're not creating something that feels so vacuous that that like the the recipient is like I'm, how does that connect yeah. to right the purveyor? So I think that's that's key. Um, for mine, I'm going to reiterate what I just said. Um, is that we don't really think about trust. Um, from a day-to-day -day perspective, we think about reach, we think about demographics, we think about audience. Um, so maybe you know, in that planning process, when we're thinking about uh, thought leadership, um, including trust into, into that conversation. It reminds me of the famous Peter Drucker quote, what, what, gets, man what gets measured gets managed. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. if, it does, if you don't manage it, if you don't measure it, you're not gonna manage it. Just as hard as you try, it's always gonna fall be by the wayside, unless you have numbers, unless you have frameworks to track against. Definitely. Last um, word. Yes, so I think picking up on the humanity, right, and one of the currency of trust pillars is communicate with a human voice. I think that's important because when you do that, that means you're addressing a person, right, the employee or your customer. What great unifying thing that is when you are addressing the customer's concerns or the employee's concern. Um, you may not know this, but the SEC created a, Gantt, a handbook for plain English uh, in, uh, in financial disclosures. The preface was by Warren Buffett. Would you guess when this was sent out? When were people being enjoined to already use plain English? 1998. PwC in 2009, when we did a brand relaunch, we actually did how we write and put guidelines out on how we communicate with a human voice, how we communicate with purpose. 
And I think it's a very important thing in thought leadership because as we bring the experts together, you know, there are certain really thick jargon uh, that the academics have, but they have something useful to say. So with people in thought leadership, right, we call that out, we curate, we translate, and we communicate with a human voice. We get the data in there, we match up the story so that it's human. I think this is a wonderfully creative task for, for thought leadership people today, and something that all of us can do um, in our own expert, spiel, expert fields, communicate with a human voice. Wonderful, it's a great way to close out the part of the panel. Now, questions. I'm sure there are a few. If not, I'll be happy to cold call on people in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Mr. Wong. Uh, first of all, what, oh. I want to thank our four panelists today for being provocative <clears throat> and entertaining and contrarian uh, on an early Tuesday morning. So thank you so much for that. Uh, within the walls of LinkedIn, there's been a tremendous amount of cheerleading since Barbara's research was released, <laughs> as you might imagine. You can hear things like, we're number one, you know, kind of in, in, in any LinkedIn office, <clears throat> which has been fantastic. But my question for the panel, and, and maybe start with Ben, is what do we do next to kind of sustain the momentum we've created and the conversation we've stimulated around the importance of trust? What does LinkedIn do next? Um, I, I think you have to lean in to this moment. I mean, I think that there's a lot of questions. I, look, I, these different platforms play different roles in an evolving ecosystem. So my comment about Facebook was, will cease to exist as we currently know it. So I, I don't, it's not gonna evaporate. So I think that the, the opportunity for LinkedIn is to continue to differentiate and be clear um, to its customers, right? And I'm focusing on that now from a business advice standpoint as to why the plat what is the unique value proposition that the platform offers that other platforms don't. That thought leadership platform that I think kind of can be grounded and founded in, in a more <coughs> profound, arguably, way in a, from a B2B standpoint has value and extension in the others, but you have a specialness right now that, you know, again, we there, there will be a mistake at LinkedIn. So, how, how, you know, are you prepared and how you're going to navigate out of that? And are you doing everything from a technical standpoint, from an ethical standpoint, from a value standpoint, to ensure that, that, that you're protecting that specialness? Great. Maybe from over here, anyone? Well, we can go to Barbara. Do you have a do you have a take on oh, so you do you have a take on what, what Mike asked Ben since you studied all the different platforms? Definitely. More of a um, the reason I, I keep bringing up reach is you know we have to be practical in, in certain circumstances where you might be looking to reach a certain type, um, a certain audience, um, and uh, you know we've seen Facebook grow massively, and as you see any large digital platform now, they've had to go through stages where they had to grow, evolve, and change. Um, and I think as LinkedIn grows, it's, it's kind of like which, which parts um, of LinkedIn do you want to stay true to and, and kind of hold to um, and, and not necessarily move away from that message or that trust or that environment or that mindset that we all come to LinkedIn for. Um, you know, echoing a little bit of, of what you had said, um, I think that is really going to be the key um, as, as LinkedIn continues on their journey. Yes, in the back. I had a question for Christina. Um, really couldn't agree more about finding the human voice, but particularly in a B2B environment, what kind of filters or mechanisms do you put in place to understand that you have the right measurement around that human voice? So when it becomes too folksy, have you lost your audience it, while you're at the same time trying to get out of the you know, heavy academia space and thought leadership? So let's combine machine and people. So there's still, thank God, there's still a role for editors, <laughs> right? Because the tonality and all of that, uh, and we've had some mishaps. I'm not gonna relate to you some mishaps of some hashtags we tried in the past that were like, ugh, not really good. And I, I quite admire companies like you know, Goldman Sachs, for example, and other companies that can be quite playful on social media, but still be very serious. They're, that's quite a, a nice, you know, talent. But 
uh, there's this thing called a readability score on your software program, right? Have, has anybody turned on readability scores? You turn it on in Microsoft Word, and you let it give you a readability score for your document. And it gives you some kind of score, which uh, is called a Flash Kincaid score, and it gives you the grade level that can read your, your things. Um, and so The Economist, for example, scores at 50 in general, right? Uh, Business Insider or whatever may scores in the 75. Uh, law journals, they score in the 30s. So when we initially score them, I think it's very helpful, especially if you're saying to somebody a superior to you or a leader of the firm, right? You know, it's good to have readability scores. It just says, okay, do you want to write like, you know, somebody who writes for a law journal or not? Because if it's 32, then probably you're addressing the right thing. And you're, but it's self-evident. If they wanted to reach something wider, right, you'd have to change. And so there we can consult and help. Uh, but for the tonality in general of things that go social media, it's very hand, you know, it's handcrafted. But uh, I, I did not appreciate the readability score until an auditor pointed out to me the value of it in teaching people and being more aware uh, about whether you're writing to to a journal or to people who can find it accessible. Uh, I mean, seriously, also, I think David had pointed out, a lot of content agencies that are writing stories for brands, right, are doing a great job. And you see them win the game. You see them win emotion and motivation. And I think it's increased uh, the, the motivation of people in business to write in a way that resonates. So that, that's helpful. I'd, I'd just say one thing to follow on that, actually two things. Uh, talk to your average seventh grader and you'll know exactly what you should write for. Because if you look at Fleisch Kincaid, I'm serious, it's, it's less sophisticated than you think if you want people to actually pay attention uh, and take it on board easily and quickly, which is after all, you know, lowering the barrier. The other thing is, yeah, you can do the readability score. There are also services out there. We've worked with one called Quantified Communications that uh, specializes in using technology to evaluate the clarity with which business writing is delivered or even executive presentations. So we've had them measure a whole range of different kinds of communication to give us data that we can then look at and say, yeah, this isn't us telling you to dumb it down. This is data telling you to dumb it down. And dumb it down is not a pejorative, right? Dumb it down is Stop trying to impress your college professor. You know, try to reach your audience. Uh, and there are other fir firms that do this kind of thing too. But there's all sorts of ways of, of addressing that. But don't forget the importance of the editor. <laughs> Great. We have about oh, we have one more question. One more? Great. The sun. Question for Christina and the panel as well. What are your thoughts on the challenges and, frankly, opportunities in being authentic? with your thought leadership in a highly regulated space? Yeah, that's a great one. Um, I think, by the way, one of the most uh, kind of popular things I put on, on Twitter was this article from Stanford School of Business that said, authenticity paradox. If you flaunt it, you lose it. And that resonated with a lot of people, right? So we don't talk about how authentic we are. We just have to behave authentically. And one of the things we do in PwC, we serve many, many, many clients. So you would never have us weigh in on a particular, on a particular client, right? We would never exercise judgment on behalf of a client. We are regulated in that we can't do that. But we're very good at putting forth the key considerations that uh, the reader needs to have in order to ex exercise that judgment wisely. I think then we are authentic to ourselves as people who are experts in different fields, uh, experts in managing risk, right, and understanding the technology underneath by giving a, what I would say, a more, a good, complete set of key considerations for you guys to make informed judgment. And that we feel is authentic to what our mission is. Fantastic. I'd just add the, the legal department is not the adversary, right? <laughs> like, I, I, like and, and I think we get in a, in, a wrong, in a wrong continuum, right? Like, I'm the marketer communicator, and my job is to create risk that drives sales, right? And their job is to be concrete ankle boots, right? And that's not, 
So how do I engage, like their department and my department has the exact same mission, which is to protect and advance the enterprise in a profitable, sustainable, and ethical way. So if I start the dialogue there, a fully baked campaign that I just send over at the 11th hour for legal to review and approve is probably not going to get approved. That's probably not because it's flawed. That's probably because of a flawed human interaction. Yeah. So they're my colleagues with a shared mission, and I just think we have to engage them more often, more frequently, and more in advance. And I think we'll find the path to yes a lot easier and faster. Great. I forgot something about authenticity, which is I think in thought leadership, um, you know, framing the problem is important. Mm. Because that's, I think, what unlocks a new way of thinking about things. It's very hard to be a thought leader now, because we all kind of are thinking very hard. But if you have a new way of thinking about an old problem, by all means, that's the, the territory. So I think in that, in that sense, the expectation is not that we would be 100% right in the way we framed it. We are evaluated on how fruitful that framing is in unlocking new avenues of understanding and action. Yeah. And that could still be authentic without saying I'm 100% correct. <laughs> you know, I'm just saying maybe we think about it differently. Yeah? Great. And that's, I think, thought leadership. Great. Stuff. I think on that note, we're a little bit over time. So I know most of us have day jobs we need to get to <laughs> on a Tuesday morning. So thank you so much to the panel. This has been so great. Thank, thank you all for coming. Um, I, I believe this is being recorded and we're making it accessible to you. Again, we mentioned the uh, Currency of Trust Hub that we've published that you can very easily find on LinkedIn. And uh, have a wonderful day. Thank you for coming. Thank you.